Hello, good afternoon to those of you on the East Coast and Central Time, and uh, good morning to those of you in Mountain and Pacific Time. Uh, my name is Kira Zeitelman. I'm with the Nehruk Center for Partnerships and Innovation, and I'd like to welcome you all today to our first uh, in a series of six webinars on carbon capture, utilization, and storage. Today's webinar will focus on the case for carbon capture, utilization, and storage. And I'd like to encourage everyone to ask questions throughout the webinar. We will have time uh, towards the end for Q&A. Um, please submit your questions via the questions box in uh, GoToWebinar. Uh, next slide, Jasmine. Uh, so today we're very fortunate to be joined by uh, three expert speakers in the carbon capture, utilization, and storage field. Uh, we have Kip Coddington, uh, Director of the Center for Energy Research and Policy Analysis at the University of Wyoming. We also have Brad Crabtree, Vice President of Carbon Management for the Great Plains Institute, and Cecile Conroy, Director of Government Affairs at the International Brotherhood of Boilermakers. So I'll pass things over to our first speaker, Kip. Kira, thank you so very much. Um, just first of all, I want to offer my thanks um, uh, to the sponsors, the Western Interstate Energy Board and the NARU Subcommittee on Clean Coal and Carbon Management. I also want to give a special shout out of, of thanks to Kara Fornstrom, the chairwoman of the Wyoming Public Service Commission, um, who, who was a leading force behind putting this six part series together. And also it's a privilege to be on this panel with Brad and Cecile. Um, also, I hope everyone is well in these challenging times with the pandemic, and it's, uh, we're all thinking about our colleagues on the West Coast who are dealing with those devastating fires. And so we hope everyone is safe and well. I'm going to spend um, spend a couple minutes uh, giving a broad overview of carbon capture and storage. Then I'm going to get out of the way and and hand it hand it over to Brad. Um, if we could turn to the next slide, uh, please. So as, as many of you know, carbon, carbon, why are we talking about carbon capture utilization? Carbon capture utilization and storage involves the capture of carbon dioxide from the combustion of any carbon containing fuel, and then it's utilization and, and storage. So the, this technology is driven largely, but not exclusively by the carbon reduction policies that are in place at all levels of government from the Paris Agreement internationally, which calls for the effective decarbonization of all energy systems, to those of us in the United States, U.S. federal law. So shortly after the decision of this U.S. Supreme Court in 2007, uh, the federal EPA has been regulating greenhouse gas emissions from any number of stationary and mobile sources. Um, and those requirements continue there are also a plethora of state carbon management requirements. You'll see that on the next slide. And even beyond the law, there are corporate com uh, commitments and investor shareholder preferences. So we, we live in a society where carbon is being managed either by law or by preference. Next slide, please. This slide shows, um, just as of a few months ago, the, the current status of states that have enacted any number of various forms of clean energy or, or renewable energy requirements and or, or goals, uh, typically for electricity generation, um, but also for, for fuels and other, other energy types. So as you can see, for, for great swaths of the United States, there are, there are state requirements regarding reducing greenhouse gas emissions um, that are separate and apart from federal law. And that's also driving the impetus for technology such as CCUS. Next slide, please. Um, in terms of corporate commitments, um, even putting aside legal requirements, federal and state and, and international, um, many, many actors in power markets and energy markets have made carbon reduction commitments. This shows um, just a handful of them from the beginning of the alphabet for utilities that have made commitments either with respect to reducing their greenhouse gas emissions or even moving towards carbon neutrality goals. Um, and again, this also also applies to the to the oil and gas 
industry as well. Next slide, please. And then of course, um, in two months, we have this event coming up called a federal election. Um, and I am not a political prognosticator and won't pretend to be one, but um, there are many uh, legislative proposals in both the House and Senate that could take the form of a major uh, clean energy bill in early 2021. Um, here are some of the some of the contenders um, describing their type, their structure, a clean energy standard, a CES, a renewable portfolio standard. There are carbon tax proposals out there, a cap and trade proposal. Um, so it's possible we are four months away from a strengthening of these carbon reduction requirements at the federal level. Next slide, please. Um, and I just wanted to close out in my my last couple of moments here, just just emphasizing that carbon capture and storage is a is a broad based answer, a potential answer, indeed an answer for uh, many different types of uh, power systems. So carbon capture and storage is not just about um, coal, although it certainly is a path forward for coal in a decarbonized future, but it does indeed have application in, in, in many forms of power generation, coal, natural gas, biomass, um, applies to fuel production from refineries to, to ethanol, um, also would include uh, industry and manufacturing such as cement plants. Um, and indeed, if you, if you also wanted to emphasize that if you read the climate models and the, the policy assessors, I think there's a general consensus growing that we're apt to um, encounter overshoot in terms of carbon burden in the atmosphere between now and 20, 2035, 2040, 2050. So there's a lot of thought going into carbon dioxide removal technologies and negative emission technologies. So only with respect to carbon dioxide removal, Technologies. Once you take CO2 out of the atmosphere, you have to do something with it, um, either utilizing it or, or storing it. So CCUS also applies, in my opinion, to technologies such as an approach as, such as CDR. Uh, next slide, please. Um, I guess I just wanted to em emphasize with this note that um, even though it's possible that for some in the audience, CCUS may be somewhat new, but it's actually been around for a long time in, in discrete components as a matter of technology and certainly in terms of, of policy. So in terms of federal environmental requirements, uh, the, the EPA finalized its CO2 injection rules a decade ago in December 2010. Um, and if you look at many of the leading voices on um, that are assessing energy systems from, from IEA to here, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, there is a general assessment depending upon the policy path that we're on that CCUS is going to have to play a critical role in, in achieving mid-century and, and earlier climate targets. So there's lots of literature on that. Um, and that concludes my um, portion of this talk. And at this point, it's my, my privilege to, to turn it over to uh, one of the world's great leaders on, on carbon capture utilization storage, and that's Brad Crabtree. So uh, Brad, I think you've got the con. Great. Kip, uh, can you hear me? Coming through? I can. Great. Kip, thank you so much uh, for the introduction. Um, thanks to you, to Kira and Jasmine at Nehru and Commissioner Fornstrom for organizing this. It's an honor to be included in this and great to be with you all today. In the interest of time, I'll, I'll jump right in. Um, let's just go to the next slide. Um, just uh, briefly, uh, the Great Plains Institute, we're a nonprofit organization. We work regionally and nationally on a variety of energy policy and technology arenas. We've been doing work in carbon capture since 2002, so nearly 20 years. And uh, we were inspired by Dakota gasification, which began capturing nearly 3 million tons of CO2 from uh, coal gasification in 2000 in North Dakota, transporting that CO2 about 200 miles by pipeline to Southern Saskatchewan. 
And every year since then, they've stored that CO2 safely uh, and permanently in the geology in Saskatchewan. And we saw that as a real opportunity to use technology to meet decarbonization goals while sustaining jobs and economic production, which is critical to our state and to many regions of the country. And I won't list to you all the work we've done, but it's been state, regional, and national all the way up until today. Uh, next slide. So today I'm going to talk, what's the value proposition for carbon capture? Start off there, kind of walk through some of the benefits of carbon capture, and then talk about the exciting things that are happening at the federal level and the support, bipartisan and broad stakeholder support we're seeing for the deployment of the technology. Uh, and, that, and that includes the Carbon Capture Coalition at the federal level. And then I'll end by talking about work that's going on across much of the country at the state and regional level and two initiatives in that regard, uh, the State Carbon Capture Work Group and the Regional Carbon Capture Deployment Initiatives that are being coordinated through the work group. And the goal of all three of these initiatives and frankly the mission of our carbon management program at Great Plains Institute is to achieve economy-wide deployment of carbon capture, which we define as capturing CO2 or carbon monoxide from power plants, industrial facilities, and Kip was, as Kip was mentioning, from ambient air as well. The transport of that CO2 to where it can be stored uh, or put to beneficial use, and then of course the, re, uh, the use of the atmospheric removal and geologic storage of that captured carbon, so the whole value chain. Next. So let's start off right. There are many reasons why we should do carbon capture, and I'll try to talk about most of them. But the major, major case for carbon capture is that it's not optional if we want to meet mid-century climate goals. Kip talked about that a little bit. Um, the International Energy Agency, the IEA, has done extensive modeling of meeting the two-degree goal, which is the Paris goal, holding warming to two degrees centigrade over pre-industrial levels. Um, their modeling shows that if we're to meet that goal, that one-fifth of all the reductions achieved annually by 2050 need to come from carbon capture. And cumulatively, between now and 2050, 14% of all emissions reductions must come from carbon capture based on their modeling to meet the goal. What's interesting, and I'll talk more about this in a moment, is nearly half those emissions come from industrial facilities, not from power plants. The IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, has also done different modeling. They also show the essential importance of carbon capture, but they also show the economic consequences of meeting these goals if we don't have economy-wide deployment of carbon capture. And what their modeling finds is that the costs go up 138% if carbon capture is taken off the table as one of the mitigation options. And finally, Kip mentioned uh, the 1.5 degree goal. That's the more aspirational goal. Um, the modeling by the IPCC in that regard is really dramatic. Not only if we want to be confident about meeting that goal, do we need to deploy carbon capture economy-wide on industrial facilities and power plants, but we also have to start drawing down atmospheric CO2 through direct air capture, capturing CO2 from bioenergy where we're taking the photosynthetic carbon that's stored in the biomass and not re-emitting it back to the atmosphere. Uh, it's a really dramatic challenge and carbon capture features prominently in, in meeting the, the 1.5 degree goal based on the modeling. Next slide. So this is just a graph showing the sustainable development scenario in the IEA modeling. And I just want to call your attention to the lower left, which is the scale question. Um, right now we have 30 to 40 million tons of annual CO2 capture and storage around the world. And based on the IEA modeling, we need to have 2,300 megatons annually by 2040. Uh, just to give you a notion, that's roughly a 60-fold increase from where we are today. Now, is that a, is that a dramatic challenge? It is, um, but if, there's a number of things we can look at in our energy system where we have scaled over a 30-year per, period uh, uh, proportionally in the same way. Next slide. So if carbon capture, carbon capture has a big 
heavy lift here to do if we're uh, thinking about the one, a two degree goal, let alone the 1.5 degree goal. Uh, is it up to the task? And that's a fair question. It's a question that's asked a lot in the media and in policy circles. So I'm going to walk through now uh, the case for carbon capture kind of point by point. Um, first of all, let me emphasize, contrary to popular perception, uh, carbon capture is about much more than power plants and fossil fuels. In fact, most people aren't aware of this, but there are 13 commercial scale carbon capture facilities in the United States today. 12 of them are in industrial sectors. Only one is a power plant. So the public attention to carbon capture is the reverse of the commercial reality on the ground. Um, it's also significant from a uh, emission standpoint. Uh, about one third of US and global carbon emissions are industrial. If you just take the sectors steel, cement, and basic chemicals, that's half of those industrial emissions worldwide, so one half of the third. And then half, over half of the emissions from those sectors are what are called process emissions. In other words, they're unrelated to the energy inputs that go into those industrial processes. They are actually the result of the chemistry of much industrial production in the world today. If we are to meet mid-century climate goals, we have no choice but to deploy carbon capture uh, in industrial facilities across the globe as well as in the United States. Next slide. Um, the other key thing is that carbon capture works full stop. Um, if you look at the deployment experience of carbon capture and compare, compare that to other low and zero carbon technologies, it has performed as well or better to date given the level of deployment as wind and solar have. Uh, carbon capture gets a bad rap because there are a few projects that did not occur or, or did not meet their targets. Often it had nothing to do with the carbon capture technology itself. But the reality is, and you look at the, on the left there, we have a series of successful commercial technology milestones going back to 1972, nearly 50 years of large scale commercial experience. And it started in gas separation of CO2 and gas processing but it expanded then to gasification, later, uh, you know, separating, capturing CO2 from hydrogen production, and then, uh, 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 excuse me, uh, ethanol production, more recently then in power production, and then overseas we have commercial large-scale capture of CO2 in the steel industry. The point being that, and I, if, if there's, you have a, a, in this series of presentation coming later on, that will focus on technology. So I'm not going to get into the details of the technology. If you take one thing away from this slide, please understand our, our challenge in, in uh, carbon capture deployment is not technological. We know enough about the core technologies. We have enough experience at scale to know that we can dramatically increase carbon capture deployment. The challenge is one of public policy and political will. If we put in place the same level of public policy support that wind, solar, and other low carbon technologies enjoy today, and they have that same type of policy framework for carbon capture, we can meet the challenge. Uh, and I'll just, before moving to the next slide, point out that we have nearly five, over 5,000 miles of CO2 pipelines in the United States uh, delivering CO2 uh, to various markets and purposes. Um, and 25 million tons of CO2 being captured from, again, mostly industrial sources in the United States today. Next slide. There's a bit of a delay when this for the slides coming. I apologize for that. The other thing is that carbon capture is not just a niche. Um, there's a tendency to say, well, it's fine when you can do it, but it only works in certain instances. That's just not true. Um, the experience we have to date is already large scale. In the United States, industry has already injected nearly 1.5 billion tons of CO2 into the subsurface, into geologic formations. There have been no fatalities, no serious inju injuries, and no major environmental incidents. The bulk of that CO2 injection is for enhanced oil recovery, uh, which results in the storage of the CO2. Uh, but there is oil production in the process. It's worth noting that based on IEA analysis, uh, because of the amount of CO2 that's injected in the process relative to the oil that's produced, you still get a 37% net reduction on average in life cycle CO2 emissions. It's very significant. 
However, long term, the emphasis needs to be on scaling up saline geologic storage. That's geologic storage where you don't have associated oil production. And we've already done that over decades in multiple locations across the world, including in the United States. And to date, over a billion ton, quarter billion tons of CO2 from industrial and power plant sources have been stored safely and permanently in geologic formations around the world. And just looking at the United States alone, we have centuries to thousands of years worth of, of storage capacity in these saline formations and to a lesser degree in oil and gas fields. So this is a uh, more carbon capture potential is more than enough to meet our climate challenges for, for generations to come. Next. The other thing, uh, carbon capture is actually a lot more cost effective than people realize. Uh, the, when we think about the cost of various energy technologies, the tendency is to look at the levelized cost of energy, which is comparing something new to something else that's new. And that's really not how carbon capture is deployed. The bulk of carbon capture will not be on new facilities, but retrofits of existing facilities. And so you're building into an existing system. And so the, the appropriate metric for cost is the cost to avoid or reduce a ton of CO2 emissions. And based on that metric, carbon capture is already cost effective. If you look at the whole suite of technologies we need to meet climate goals, from carbon capture to renewables to efficiency, and look at the costs on a per ton basis, what you find is that carbon capture technologies are kind of across that whole spectrum of costs interspersed with renewables and efficiency depending on the application. So the cost of carbon capture typically depends on the, how pure the CO2 emission stream is. And so for the most pure sources, ethanol, gas processing, ammonia, you have exceedingly low capture costs. 15 to $20 per metric ton for capture and compression, that's cheaper than almost all renewables. Um, you go to hydrogen, cement, uh, some refinery uh, uh, applications, steel, costs get higher, 40 to $60 a ton, still competitive with a, a number, many renewables applications, uh, but certainly uh, more costly and challenging. It's only when you get to power plants that the costs go up significantly. Even there, it's less than people realize from coal-fired power plants, 55 to $65 a ton, and from natural gas power plants, 65 to 75. Those are costs that in certain markets and in certain contexts on a per ton basis are still cheaper than many things that we're mandating today in, in the context of clean energy. And either probably not time to talk about that today, but uh, just the point being that we have to do all of these things to meet climate goals. And within that context of all the things we need to do, these carbon capture applications are already cost effective. We just need the right policy framework to support them. Next slide. So finally, and last but not, but, but still very important, um, if we're going to decarbonize the US economy, we have to do so in a way that supports uh, our high wage energy, industrial and manufacturing job space. And carbon capture is absolutely essential to that. Uh, and that is actually one of the great opportunities we have is that carbon capture technologies allow existing economic activities and the job space and communities they support to continue while, while decarbonizing often to near zero uh, levels. What you see on this slide is, uh, on the left is a map of the US, and there you see mapped the, uh, what are now just over 30 carbon capture projects under development in response to the 45Q tax credit, which I'll talk about in a moment. And what you can see is a pretty good geographic diversity of those projects, and uh, it's a little hard to read, but you can see that uh, it's from, kind of spans the economy as well, industrial and power. And what's also important to note is that if you look at these projects, a majority of these projects are aiming to store their CO2 not in the context of enhanced oil recovery and oil production, but actually in saline formations. And that's something that's not well understood. So it's a very exciting development we have underway and very important economically as well. And then on the right-hand side, this is analysis just out that we commissioned from the by the Rhodium Group, looking at what are the jobs implications of carbon capture retrofits, representative projects in various industries, as well as representative uh, CO2 transport projects. 
and the left-hand column are the jobs at the time of construction, and then the operational jobs are in the right-hand column. I won't read them all to you. The important thing to note here is that even the least job-intensive projects with ethanol plants are still provide tens uh, of jobs, uh, and these are typically in very small communities, so it's an important impact. And then when you get up to steel mills, power plants, refineries, and so forth, you're talking about very, very significant levels of job creation, and then even more significant in the construction phase. Next slide. And I'll point out also that these jobs also pay at above prevailing wages in the various regions, so they're very high wage and high skill. So turning to the federal level, uh, I want to just share with you briefly, you know, what's really happening that's exciting in terms of growing bipartisan support and industry, environmental groups, and labor unions all coming together to support this policy agenda. So in my capacity at the Great Plains Institute, I help staff the Carbon Capture Coalition, which uh, was founded in 2011 and now has 80 members from energy industrial technology companies, from both energy and industrial labor unions, and then we have conservation, environmental, and clean energy NGOs all working together, and they operate by consensus. That we have, if we take a policy position or endorse legislation, it's because all 80 members agree to do so. If you think about the polarization in American politics generally, and the conflict over climate policy that we see in the country today. Think about for a moment that we have a coalition here of this diversity that's actually not just working together, but unanimous in the positions that they take. And they have a mission together of achieving economy-wide deployment, again, of carbon capture, uh, and the various participants come at it from the, they're, they're brought together by all the benefits that carbon capture provides, the climate benefits, the energy and industrial production that can be sustained with this technology and the ability to both retain and create high wage jobs. And uh, so it's a very exciting endeavor uh, and it's a, I would say unprecedented in the context of, of US climate pol energy and climate policy for sure. Uh, next slide. The Carbon Capture Coalition worked together for seven years Oh, I'm sorry, this is the membership slide. I just wanted to have you see this slide quickly just to see the diversity of the participants uh, that are working together uh, on, on this issue. Uh, it's very inspiring. I'll, in, the, in the interest of time, I'll keep going. Um, so the coalition worked for seven years to uh, develop a proposal for reforming and expanding the Section 45Q tax credit, which is a tax credit for capturing and storing CO2 or putting it to beneficial use. And uh, it was a long, hard effort, but uh, I want to share this slide because it underscores the political opportunity we have here to build consensus uh, with using carbon capture around energy and climate policy on a bipartisan basis, and not just a little bipartisan, deeply bipartisan. The Future Act, which is the legislation that passed, had 25 co-sponsors in the Senate, 18 Democrats, six Republicans. In the House, there were 50 co-sponsors, so about 10% of the House. Um, and the, um, the ratio was the reverse, 35 Republicans and 15 Democrats. What's interesting to note here is this wasn't just one party and then some moderates from the other party. These were the most conservative and the most liberal members of both parties joined together around this legislation. Next slide. So I'm gonna very briefly, many of you know about 45Q. I'm not going to take a lot of time on this, but for those who may not be familiar about the 45Q tax credit, I'll give you just a very quick snapshot. Um, first of all, if you think of the, if you know about the wind production tax credit, uh, I'm sure you do. The 45Q tax credit functions similarly in that you cannot claim the tax credit unless you have performed the, uh, in this case, geologic storage of the CO2. You don't claim that it's not like an investment tax credit for solar where you get the money up front. You actually have to demonstrate that you've stored or used the CO2 in the way that the law requires. And it provides $35 a ton for every ton of CO2 stored through the process of enhanced 
uh, uh, oil recovery. That's geologic storage. Uh, it has to be demonstrated uh, and uh, monitoring and reporting done to EPA. And then if you store the CO2 in a saline geologic formation, it's $50 per metric ton. There's no oil production associated with it, so you don't have that revenue. That's why it's a higher dollar value. And then in the case of taking that captured carbon, either CO2 or carbon monoxide, and, con and converting it into a useful product, uh, in that case, you can claim $35 per ton of CO2 emissions that's reduced in your utilization process. Um, the L we this was an existing tax credit prior to the Future Act, but it didn't work. It was on the books, but was not functional. And so we worked really hard to make some improvements. One was to expand eligibility. Uh, and that included, of course, not only carbon capture for geologic storage, but also the utilization component is new. We also made sure that direct air capture, so capturing CO2 from the atmosphere was eligible and adding carbon monoxide, not just CO2, because in industrial facilities that emit carbon monoxide, it ends up being CO2 in the process. Um, the other thing we did is we designed the tax credit to really improve the financial certainty. So it would really be a tool for helping project developers and investors finance their carbon capture projects. Uh, the final thing that's really important is that the thresholds for participation were lowered, especially in industrial sectors. It used to be 500,000 tons of CO2 captured every year. Now it's 100,000 tons and it opens up to a whole range of industries that weren't able to participate before. Uh, next slide. So now that carbon capture for the first time has a federal policy incentive, uh, when the wind production tax credit has been on the books enacted by Congress in, in 1992, and the investment tax credit for solar was enacted in 2005. Contrary to what's off, people think there's been a lot of public subsidy of carbon capture. There's actually been very, very little. Other than the Obama Administration Stimulus Act, there's been virtually no federal support for carbon capture until the enactment of the 45Q tax credit. Now that there is this cornerstone incentive in place, um, there's an effort to create that full policy portfolio. We want to take a, 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 a take a page from the success of wind and solar um, and try to create the same scaling up of carbon capture technology to meet climate goals that we've seen uh, so successfully with other technologies. So toward that end, after the passage of the Future Act, the Carbon Capture Coalition came together and developed a federal policy blueprint, released it in, um, in, in May of last year. And that too has the consensus of the coalition's 80 companies, unions, and NGOs. And, and it covers financial incentives, regulatory policy, uh, support for CO2 transport infrastructure, and uh, a number of other things. Next slide. Uh, in, in the upcoming webinar in this series, you're going to have a more detailed presentation of federal policy. So my background here on federal policy is limited to this slide, and I'll just talk about some of the things that are identified here in terms of what we're trying to do in, in developing a full federal policy portfolio for carbon capture. Um, first and foremost, we're working very hard right now, have been for two years, to make sure that 45Q is implemented effectively by the IRS and Treasury. Uh, we were so excited in February of 2018 to pass the legislation after so many years of effort, and it was very discouraging to find that the IRS was not issuing guidance and a proposed rule uh, so that companies and investors could utilize the tax credit. So we basically initiated a campaign for nearly a year to put pressure on the IRS and Treasury to prioritize guidance and rulemaking for 45Q. To their credit, that's now been done. And we're finally in the process of this really important tax credit being available to the project development and investment community. Um, that said, it's important to note when Congress enacted the 45Q legislation, they authorized the tax credit for six years. We've lost over two years to the delays at the IRS. This means that for any project to qualify for 45Q, it has to begin construction by the end of 2023. That's a very short time frame. The other thing is uh, that we're working very hard on is both to enact improvements to 45Q um, 
as well as additional incentives of the types that you see for wind, solar, and other technologies, and also have uh, them be eligible for carbon capture to further support uh, finance and investment uh, in carbon capture projects. The third kind of key area of focus, uh, we spent years, rightfully so, trying to get an incentive for deployment of, and financing of carbon capture technology. We did not spend a lot of time on the infrastructure to transport that CO2. That is now uh, an equal priority for us, along with incentives for capture. And we're working on legislation. We've got some legislation already introduced and additional legislation forthcoming that where the federal government can play a role in financing the build, build out of CO2 transport infrastructure as part of a broader national infrastructure agenda. The other thing that's really important is historically, even though the bulk of carbon capture technology and deployment has been in the industrial sectors, the focus of the Department of Energy and federal policy has been on power generation, in particular coal-based generation. We are not, we are supporting that. We are not suggesting that be reduced. What we are saying is given the importance of carbon capture from a climate and economic and job standpoint, we need to increase the overall level of federal investment and therefore uh, prioritize and diversify other things in addition to uh, power generation. And that includes uh, the transport infrastructure, as I said, capture from industrial sources, cement, steel, chemicals, and others, the utilization of captured carbon to make a whole variety of project products, low carbon fuels, chemicals, advanced materials, building products, et cetera. And then finally, but very importantly, accelerating uh, the deployment and commercialization of direct air capture technologies. And then the final thought here on the um, federal policy is just to point out that COVID is a major challenge facing our nation. And we are spending trillions of dollars to respond to the pandemic. There are opportunities to put people back to work and stimulate economic activity, but do so in ways that may provide for investments in this technology for the long term. So we also have recommendations for how to support the COVID pandemic response while also putting us on the path to economy-wide deployment of carbon capture. Next slide. I'm gonna very quickly, just next slide as well, in the interest of time. Um, so at the state level, I just want to quickly share with you some exciting things that are going on. Um, in 2015, we worked with former Governor Mead of Wyoming and current Governor Bullock of Montana to launch the state carbon capture work group. It now has the 16 states that you see in dark green. Uh, they made a series of excellent policy recommendations uh, from, tw from 2015 to 2018. Uh, at, in 2018, the governors came to us and said, okay, now that the 45Q tax credit is passed, we really need to focus on deployment. And, and as a result, we launched what are called the Midwestern and Western Regional Deployment Initiatives. We've started undertaking a modeling effort. And I'm gonna just in the last few slides share these with you. Next slide. So here you see the states that we're currently working with the map. And these are the two regions for the Midwestern and Western uh, deployment initiatives. Next slide. I want to just quickly take you through the modeling of uh, the deployment of carbon capture, transport, and storage that we see possible with the 45Q tax credit coupled with state policy. And just on the left, you see the various uh, components. We undertook a two-year national modeling effort with all those partners that you see there. Uh, federal government, states, private sector, uh, worked with Los Alamos National Lab and their SIMCS, CCS model to map out what deployment could look like based on all these inputs. Next slide. We looked at, we took all the facilities that are eligible under 45Q across industries, as you see here. The ones that are, are colored are the ones that are in the study region, but you see the number of facilities across the country that, um, that are eligible. Next slide, and the industries as well. And then we, we uh, did financial analysis of the capture costs by industry, uh, facility by facility in the study region. And again, you see all the industries that we're covering there. Uh, power production is only one of, one of many. Next slide. 
And so we plugged all that into the model and we did a near to medium term scenario based on current policy and likely state policy and what could be accomplished. And what you see here, the study region is the shaded area. We will add in the uh, eastern and western states as we have resources and time. But what you see there in this near to medium term scenario is three, a, a third of a gigaton, 300 million metric tons of carbon management. And you see the various industries across the region that CO2 is being captured from. You see where storage and capture can come together along with infrastructure to create carbon hubs and how particular states are especially positioned to benefit from both the infrastructure and the project deployment. This modeling has really underscored for states that this is not just about climate, although this is that's very important. It's also about building a new carbon economy in which their states can lead in the 21st century. Um, next slide. This is the long-term scenario, uh, more towards mid-century, and it looks at storage as the previous scenario did in both uh, oil and gas fields and saline formations. The important thing to note is we're talking about two-thirds of a gigaton, 670 million tons of carbon management here. The, the U.S. emits about 5 billion tons of CO2, so if you add in the coast, we assume that we could have at least a billion tons worth of carbon management through the deployment of carbon capture and the associated infrastructure, that would put us on track to achieve the 20% of total reductions that are needed from carbon capture by 2050. It's a very exciting result from this modeling. Next slide. And here I'm just ending. So our goal now in working with the states and the carbon capture work group and the deployment initiative is to help states become what we're calling carbon capture ready and that's to take full advantage while it's available of this 45Q tax credit. It's a huge opportunity for carbon mitigation and economic development. And so we are recommending a overall policy menu that states should implement if they want to be uh, ready for project developers and investors to, to undertake projects in their state. And you see the list of the areas of policy that are part of that kind of necessary framework. Uh, we're helping uh, states establish policy teams. Next slide. All looking towards uh, the legislative session next year and the following year. We put a web tool online. It's a website that provides information, uh, the results of the modeling I just showed you. State level fact sheets are nearing completion. Some are already up uh, and ready to go. Best practices and uh, a number of fact sheets and other information that uh, would be useful to state policymakers. It's at carboncaptureready.org. We're improving it all the time. We hope that all of you representing the different states can find this useful for your work. And I think that was my last slide. Yep, we'll end there. Thank you, Brad. Uh, we will now go to Cecile Conroy. Um, Cecile, did you want to make any remarks to uh, briefly introduce the video? Yes, thank you very much. Uh, thank you for having me and for the invitation to be here today. Uh, just by way of background, the International Brotherhood of Boilermakers is a diverse union. Our members work in direct energy facilities such as power plants and refineries, plus energy intensive facilities such as cement, other manufacturing and shipbuilding. And we have been advocating for CCS for over a decade, stressing the importance of this technology in meeting global carbon reduction goals. And in 2018, the boiler makers produced a short film on CCS to add another tool to our advocacy with lawmakers and industry leaders a general and, and even reaching out to our membership. Uh, we are very grateful to the experts who lent their voices to this project. And we appreciate the opportunity to share the film with you here now. So thank you very much. really they headed really into, into no man's land. land. We emit 54 we emit billion, billion tons of CO2 tons every, every year. year. That is a hundred times, times the weight of all the human beings all. in the world. We're having the warmest years ever on record. It'll be an inhospitable planet if we don't do anything. 
We also cannot shut down the fossil fuels tomorrow or in a week or in a month in order to transition into cleaner fuels. It is impossible for that to happen quickly, period. 40% of the people believe that we'll be off petroleum in 10 years from now. I'm thinking, is that on Mars that they believe that? People are wondering what we're going to be doing. At the end of the day, if what you care about is our planet and our home, then really you want to embrace everything that can get this problem solved. We need everything. We need wind, we need solar, but we also need these other options. If actually what you want is something where it's rather invisible, but it's doing the job of thousands upon thousands of solar cells and hundreds and hundreds of wind turbines, then that's really CCS. Carbon capture simply is capturing carbon from large emitters. It's the removal of CO2 from emissions, compressing it, putting it down a pipeline. And store it into deep reservoirs. There are no underground caverns or anything like that. What you end up uh, storing it in is, in is in things like this. And this is a, a porous sandstone. So while this looks like a solid rock here, up to probably 20% of it is just airspace. And when you have this over the space of miles and miles and miles, you have a very large storage cavern within these rocks. we can actually see what the plume looks like underneath the surface. There's about 50 plus technologies that you can use to monitor the subsurface. And it's not rocket science, it's not new. It's just using the tools that we have now to guarantee that this can be a safe process. So I can drill a well and I can put CO2 in there. But essentially I'm just creating a really expensive garbage dump. But if you can use that CO2 for pharmaceuticals, you can use CO2 to make fertilizer. We can also use it in cement, plastics, gases, alternative gases. You know, this idea that you capture it and turn it into something you can sell, who wouldn't love that idea? But the amount of CO2 that we need to capture, it's just not realistic. If you do the math, without storage, we're not going to make an impact on the climate fast enough. We have to do storage, and we have to do carbon to products. We need more shots on net. Enhanced oil recovery is the number one use right now for uh, CO2. Typically, a lot of oil is left in a reservoir just because the energy that uh, drives the oil is depleted. Most of them now are on their last legs, they're at the end of life, but they still got half the oil in them that was there when you found them. But when you inject CO2, it charges that reservoir and it makes that oil more mobile. So when I put CO2, when I use it for enhanced oil recovery, I'm getting revenue back from the oil because I'm freeing up the oil that's stuck down there with the CO2. And a lot of people think that, uh, why use CO2 to make more oil? With storage with enhanced oil recovery, there is a, an economic conversation there, so that at least opens the door and gets the conversation going. We use oil. Oil is a requirement in our societies today. So if we can produce those products with a lower carbon footprint, we will be further ahead. While storage is going to be necessary, um, we also need to use enhanced oil recovery for that return in the near future. If you can generate a revenue stream by doing an environmental good, then people want that revenue stream if they can get it. We have a place to put our CO2, and the place is economic. 
And also, all the CO2 that's used for enhanced oil recovery is ultimately captured in that reservoir. So that's the beauty of it, is that you can maximize the oil production. And the second thing is you can store the CO2 permanently. That is well-proven, safe. We know where it's going. We know where it's going to places where the reservoir has been under pressure for tens of millions of years. We are nowhere close to the limits of how much CO2 we can put underground. If we took all of our emissions, we would have centuries of injection before we started to hit the limits. And it actually is completely safe, completely understood, and it's secure. It's not coming back. Now, without carbon capture and storage, it's going to be very difficult to reach some of the goals that we have set by the Paris Agreement, for example. The Paris Agreement was signed on by almost every country. The Paris Agreement is basically a weight loss club. Every country in the world raised their hand and said, I'm going to lose five pounds or I'm going to lose 10 pounds. Well, guess what? They all got to step on the scale. All of the commitments by all of the countries actually don't add up to getting us where we need to be. There's no math to get there that doesn't involve carbon capture and storage. If we actually want to hit our Paris Climate Accord goals, you will need CCS. One of the things we constantly battle is this question of how do you get CCS more visible in the general community? People know what a windmill is. They know what a solar panel is. They don't know what CCS is. They don't never seen it. It's not another type of energy. It's not an oil and gas. It's not a coal. It's not a natural gas. It's a solution to transition out of those technologies. It needs to be in the conversation because we need everything in order to get to the two degrees target. One of the problems that people perceive right away is that if I capture carbon, it's gonna cost money, and it does. But what's your alternative? You know, if you wanna use that fuel, you must clean it up. It's really finance. Each one of these projects is a big investment. I get three things. It's expensive, it requires government funding, and still doesn't make me money. Now we've shown the process or the way to clean it up. The next thing is to make it more economical. Canada's been a leader from day one. There were studies and reports and investments in Canada that showed that not only was CCS important, but also relatively straightforward to do. This was the policy that was going to help Alberta meet its carbon targets. All of that really helped kind of convince Shell corporately that Alberta and Scotford was the right place to do it. We were kind of expected an operating cost of around $44 per ton, which for Alberta with a carbon price of $30 per ton meant even after funding we would still be at a loss. Over the last few years, we're actually seeing that cost to operate quest uh, in the mid $20 per ton, which is important because it means actually now that carbon price pays for your operation. It's turned a corner in a way in terms of people are starting to see that you can knock the price down. There are going to be ways to do that. Cleaner uh, with CCS. So I think that momentum is, is starting to build it to see how we can uh, deploy more of this and get those costs down. The learning, the technology, the sensibility, the deployment, all of that is exemplary to the world. There are definitely policy drivers that we need. I think that incentives like 45Q are going to be fantastic. 45Q is going to be big going to accelerate the deployment of CCS. 
The tax credits will be $35 a ton for enhanced oil recovery or other forms of utilization and $50 a ton of CO2 for anything that's sequestered and permanently stored. Now at $50 per ton for sequestration, $35 for EOR, that gap is starting to close. And we are going to see dozens and dozens of new projects that involve power plants, heavy industry, pipelines. We got to remember that industrial processes like steel making, like plastics manufacture, pulp and paper, these things all emit CO2. Electricity isn't going to decarbonise these industries. A common misconception is that all of our CO2 emissions come from the power sector and from driving cars. That's just wrong. 20% of global emissions come from heavy industry, it comes from glass, steel, cement, concrete. These things have big carbon footprints associated with them. Importantly, we actually have no other technology at all to go after those emissions. You have to use carbon capture and storage, otherwise you just can't get those sectors. With so many recent changes in a positive direction, with governments changing their policies, we can move forward and do what's right. And the right thing is to combine carbon capture with a multitude of industrial facilities. It's a win, win, win for everyone. Our good friends from the Boilermakers are here today as well. And I've got to say, they, they woke us up to something. Here in Canada, we have 36 lodges, all of them dealing with carbon. Maybe using steel to manufacture equipment, working in a mine working on the ships. You know, CCS is the greatest facilitator into the future of high quality, high paying jobs in often rural and regional areas. You know, it's nice to have the planet hospitable, but we also need people to have meaningful lives and purpose. The name of the game is to keep people working so they can pay taxes to contribute to the communities. A lot of these coal facilities, when you look at a parking lot, the cars are in the, at the coal power plant. There's not going to be the cars at the wind farm. These capture units are big. They require a lot of pipe fitters and boiler makers and steel workers in order to make these things. There is a value in preserving communities. There is a value in expanding and securing a manufacturing base. And those values come from CCS. I don't find any other reason why we wouldn't want to support this. Taking a leadership role in advocating this technology. I see a natural fit between the needs of unions these days, the needs to preserve communities as a whole, and the opportunity that CCS provides. All Boilermakers need to be involved and advocate this technology because it affects all industries. Do you agree that we need to do more? Do you agree that these jobs are important? Do you agree that we should not burden our children and grandchildren? If you can start with something like that, then you can work very quickly into a position of, hey, we all know we got to do this. We want to be part of the solution. And this is what we're doing. And we are going to be part of the solution. This can be done.
Thank you, Cecile. Um, I know we're running a little bit short on time, but I would like to unmute uh, Lynn Brickett to ask a question. Um, Lynn, I'm not sure if you can unmute yourself. Um, yes, for those of you asking, we will be sharing uh, slides and uh, the video with attendees afterwards. We will send out an email. Um, so I do apologize, we're running a little bit short on time, so I don't think we'll be able to um, to get to some of the questions in the chat, but I'd be happy to connect uh, audience members with our speakers uh, to follow up on your questions afterwards. Um, so let's go to the next slide, please. Oh, sorry, can you go back to the schedule? I just want to encourage everyone to join us for the remainder of the webinars in this series. Uh, next week, we'll have our session on CCUS technologies, um, and we have uh, sessions every Friday through October 16th. Uh, they're all at 1 o'clock p.m. Eastern. Uh, if you registered for today's webinar, um, you've registered for all of them, so they should show up uh, on your calendar. Next slide. I just want to announce some upcoming NABRIC events. We have some innovation webinars coming up. Uh, the next one is uh, next week, September 17th from 3 to 4. And please be on the lookout for uh, invitations to our NABRIC annual meeting on November 9th through 11th. Registration should be opening for that on Monday. Next slide. Kira, this is Holly. Am I coming through? Yes. All right, thank you. Um, first, Kira, thank you. I know we're past time. Um, so a quick thank you to Chair Fornstrom and Kip also for your all the work you did pulling this together. Thank you to our speakers. Um, just to note that following the conclusion of this webinar series, this workshop series, will kick off the fall 2020 joint Krebsy YRAB meeting webinar series. Um, we're working on finalizing that agenda now, and I will offer more information in the coming weeks. Um, we'd love to have you all join us. Kira, thank you. Thank you, Holly. And as we wrap up, I just want to again thank our three panelists today. And I want to specifically recognize Kip and Chairman uh, Kara Fornstrom of the Wyoming Public Service Commission for uh, all of their help and leadership in organizing this webinar series. Um, again, please join us next Friday. I'd also like to thank the U.S. Department of Energy Fossil Energy Office for supporting this webinar and NABRIC's activities with CCUS. Uh, so thank you very much, everyone, and have a nice afternoon.